So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made of. How you live. The same as I was thinking about uh, Amos, what we're going to cover today. Bow before the lion and the lamb. Sounds kind of contradictory to me. <laughs> a lion and a lamb. A roaring lion. Very different than a lamb. But that's because God's character is both. Right? God's character. And, and we all have characters that we're complicated. But God is a lion and specifically... In Amos, the lion is roaring against sin. Not just to protect us, but against sin. And why does he roar against sin? Because sin destroys. Sin deeply wounds God's people. And he hates that. If you've been wounded by sin, you need to know God hates what hurts you, what wounded you. At the same time, when we sin, God hates what we're doing, right? And he roars like a lion against that. Now, God also knows that we need mercy. God knows that we are weak and we fall. So he is like a lamb as well. Gentle. Lovely. Beautiful. You just want to hold a beautiful lamb. He is that gracious to us. You see? That's why when we understand it's not a contradiction. God is that way. And then uh, we sing, we sang, uh, all thy works shall praise thee. All thy works shall praise thee. Creation, yeah, creation praises the Lord. But you know what praises God the most? When you and I change, when you and I become more like Jesus Christ, oh, it puts a black eye on Satan, and it praises God. When you and I change, that means that our Bible knowledge just doesn't stay up there. Our Bible knowledge literally changes us. That's what praises God. And so when we hear messages that, Oh, yeah, that was a really good message. Well, in one sense, was it good? That it made sense and it made your heart tickle? Or was it that you were convicted and ready to change by the power of the Holy Spirit? You see, we have to be very realistic. And know all thy works shall praise thy name. What works? Have you changed any? This past decade, <laughs> this past year, this past month, this past week, uh, <clears throat> we will never stop needing the need, the, the, the need to change, right, until we get to heaven. And that's how we can continue now praising God ever more here in this life as we continue to change. And when we look around us, we see the need to change, right? And so there's thousands of examples, but one of the things that I was thinking about is like, uh, today businesses know that there's no customer loyalty. They don't expect that anymore, right? So they, they have to keep uh, offering this and offering that and offering this other because there's no customer loyalty. And our teens and young adults know that their friends, quote unquote, if their friends find something more fun or more exciting, they will break their agreement to meet. 
and get together. Because something else is more excited came and, hey man, sorry, or they don't even call. Um, no faithfulness there. No, uh, no really care for where the other one is at and, and, and to give to others. Oh no, it's about me. I got to take care of me. I got to take care of me. And that is so opposite. Number one, by, uh, of how God made us. We're made in his image and being made in the image of God means that we're created to give like God gives. <laughs> and it goes against our very nature when we just become selfish, when it's just about me. And then it goes against the very work of God. Why Jesus came to earth. He came and he says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Out of them will flow rivers of water. Right? Because that's, he wants us to be just like him. He created us that way, but the fall came. And now we're all afraid of each other. And uh, I got to take care of number one because nobody else will. And so here we go. The Apostle Paul, in many different places, uh, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, by way of introduction, we'll get to Amos. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete, Paul is saying, I want you to become more like Christ, and when I see that, it will give me joy. Make my joy complete. Of the being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intended in one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, let each one of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the very form of God, did not require, uh, regard equality with God as a thing to grasp, to hold on to his mind. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is our foundation for us. Because Jesus Christ did it for us. Then we can have what it takes to then do the same and give to others selflessly. Not selfishly. But to give and to give and to give to others because otherwise we're going to stay stuck. In trying to look out for number one. And this isn't anything new. It's always been happening. This is why Jesus Christ had to come to deliver us from ourselves. And to change us. Um, so when it comes to us, I ask the question. How often do you feel let down by someone not keeping their word? It's an awful feeling. When you were counting on what someone had said that they would do or not do, and they do the opposite. Hmm. Is it hard for you to love? Because you're not, you don't feel loved, and you don't, so you just, it's hard for you to love. How often do you f find yourself not keeping your word? We don't want to think of that, but sometimes we don't keep our own words, right? Then we find all kinds of excuses. Well, they're too rich already anyway. Or they, they already have plenty of friends. Or whatever excuse. That's no big deal. 
Mm. And you know, God doesn't like that. God doesn't like that. And what we're going to see in Amos, these two little verses we're going to cover is exactly that. The Lord will bring consequences when we mistreat people and break our word for self-interest. God will bring consequences. And by the way, we didn't keep our word 20 years ago. And we've never dealt with it. It's festering in there. You see? And when we find out those things, it's praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his wonderful grace. In this passage, I mean, uh, it had been decades and decades, if not, if not over a century, that these people had been breaking their word. And God finally says, that's it. Uh, in Amos chapter 1, Amos chapter 1, we're going to cover verses 9 and 10. I ought to be done in two minutes, right? <laughs> no. Amos chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. God had been speaking to the uh, nations around Israel because eventually the, the target is Israel. His own people. But he's been working around all the different nations around them. And now he uh, comes to Tyre. Tyre is uh, on the north side. Anyway, um, let me read the passage. All right. Uh, Amos chapter 1 verse 9. Thus says the Lord. And I want you to note something right off the bat. In the time before, the beginning and the ending, it says the Lord. And this time he doesn't do that. In the end of verse 10. He doesn't say, says the Lord. And there's a reason why. And we'll get into it as we go along through the rest of the passages. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four I will not revoke its punishment. Because they delivered up an entire population to Edom, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it will consume her citadel. So we see again, verse 9 is the Lord's judgment of what they have been doing. Verse 10 is the sentence, the Lord's sentence on Tyre. Uh, <clears throat> because these statements are repeated, I want to expand this morning on for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, it will not, he, I will not revoke its punishment. What does it mean for three and for four? And I've said that it means the full and intensification of whatever. Here is the full and intensification of sin. But I want to go to a couple of other passages just to show you that this is the way it is. That that's the meaning of it. I want you to turn to Proverbs 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And as I tried to find the illustrations right from Scripture, I thought, oh my goodness, just the illustrations, I can do a whole sermon on that. Just on the illustrations. Look at this. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. It says this. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven. Which are an abomination to Him. What does that mean? The full and intensification of God's hate. And what are they? Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies. And one who spreads strife among brothers. Ooh, we could spend a lot of time there. Wow. These are the things that God repeats and intensifies his hatred when he sees those behaviors. Mm. We won't camp there. Let's go to another one. Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Verse 21. Proverbs 30. 
Verse 21. Under three things, the earth quakes. Under four, it cannot bear. In other words, uh, this gets harder and harder and harder to the point of impossibility. What are they? Under a slave when he becomes king. And a fool when he's satisfied with food. Under an unloved woman when she gets a husband. And a maidservant when she supplants her mistress. It gets harder and harder and harder. And that's why we're left, oh God help us. Because somebody has grown in an unloved home, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. Unless this person is pointed to and connects with the love of God through Jesus Christ. You see? Otherwise, that marriage gets tougher and tougher and tougher. Do you see how bad we need the Lord Jesus Christ in this life? Amen. Oh, my goodness. But I just wanted to show you how this three, no, 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 four, six, no, no, seven. It's, that's the meaning of it, you see. A full and intensification of whatever has happened. And here in Amos chapter 1, what is it? For three, no, for four. The sins of Tyre. Thus says the Lord. For three transgressions of Tyre and for four. Hmm. Um, so Tyre had repeatedly and filled up and intensified its sins. Tyre, and this is where we need to get uh, more uh, familiar and, and go back. Because you see, when God says something, and sometimes when we read something in the scriptures... It's been over 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 150 years, and it's all compact in one verse. And if we don't get that, it's like, well, what's the big deal about that? And that's why it's very important to uh, go back and say, wh wh what's going on? So I want to go back to the map, and you might have to come back, Grant. I don't know. Huh? Got it? It's up there? Okay. So you see there, anytime, by the way, you see the Mediterranean and you see a little blue dot and then a little line and then another bigger, bigger place, that's usually, okay, that's Israel. Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea on the bottom, the Mediterranean, back then it was called the Great Sea. And there you see uh, Israel. And see, if you see up on the very top, you see Tyre. See that? Not Michelin tires, just Tyre. <laughs> but that's what it is. And so, remember, it's already gone through Syria. He's gone down to Gaza. Now he goes back up to Tyre. Right? Now, um, Tyre was a, um, a powerful, powerful commercial city uh, with, with a great, great navy. A great navy. That, uh, <clears throat> right there in the Mediterranean, the east side of the Mediterranean. And they had a navy that would go all the way to Spain, all the way to North Africa, and get colonies, set up colonies to bring goods from there all the way back to Tyre. And it was an awesome, awesome navy. But you see, when we read that, we, we just read the name as nine. We don't, we don't know that. And that's why sometimes we have to look around. Uh, one place, look at Isaiah 23. Isaiah 23. Uh, again, uh, God is uh, addressing Tyre and it's like, you haven't been good. Isaiah 23. Verse 1. Isaiah 23, verse 1. The oracle concerning Tyre, wail, O ships of Tarshish. You know where Tarshish is at? It's on the other side of Spain. Way on the other side. In fact, let's see if I can do this. So, here's the Mediterranean. Right there in the middle. And Israel is way down to the bottom right. All past Italy, all the way to the left. You see Spain? Tarshish is on the 
west side, southern west side. And so when Isaiah 23, oh well, ships of Tarshish, because you do business with Tyre. That's how far they would go. For Tyre is destroyed without house or harbor. It is reported to them from the land of Cyprus, kind of in the middle. And so God is saying, yeah, I know you have a powerful navy. I know you do. Um, and it just goes on and all the way to verse 7. In this verse 6, pass over Tarshish, whale or inhabitants of the coastlands. Is this your jubilant city whose origin is from of antiquity? Whose feet used to carry her to colonize distant places? That's what Tyre was. Powerful, commercial city. Uh, even setting up colonies. But God says, you've been really, really misusing people. You have depersonalized them into things. Selling them for money. And listen. Uh, Tyre, they were not part of Israel. They were not God's people. It was a different nation of the world. It was, you know, he wasn't focusing on them, but yet God knew exactly what was happening. And so, we find this. And then it says, because you delivered up entire, an entire population to Edom. Entire population. They were selling Jews to Edom. Selling people. Can you imagine that? Uh, <clears throat> people are no longer persons. They are things. They are commodities. Someone to be used. And what's the attitude when they're able to do that? We have to be careful because we do the same thing. You know what it means? See that beautiful body walking there? Doesn't have a soul, doesn't have a spirit. It's just a piece of meat. You see that person there? I'm going to get them to buy. They're worthless. I just want their money. Huh. You see all those people over there? I can get them to do something for me. So you see they're just things. Depersonalizing people. It's a disease that all of us have. And God says, I hate that. That is an intensification, a repeated an intensification of that sin. God says, no. You sold them. You deported them. They have no more rights. Everything is taken away from them. And you're going to gain off of that. Man, can we think of that in our U.S. government today? Can we think of that in our commerce today? Online shopping. I don't care who you are. Just click, man. It's even more depersonalized. Right? Oh, no, 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 no. You're special to us. Uh-huh. <coughs> That's where we are, brothers and sisters. And if we're not careful, we fall into the same system without knowing it. Because we too can click, 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 and what? That's what God was looking at. And Tyre had already been doing that for a long, long time. A long time. Uh, because they delivered up people to Edom. Edom were the enemies of Israel. I'm gonna, they're going to deliver them and put them in a very hard, difficult situations. And you and I can be put in very hard, difficult situations because somebody is gaining, or gaining off of us. Or we can put somebody else in a very difficult situation. Because we're just using them. 
And brothers and sisters, many times we don't even think like that. Because we're trying to survive ourselves, right? We're all wounded and hurt and I just want to get something from somebody because I'm dying. Oh, do we need Jesus or what? And that's why Jesus says, don't you know that I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You see, I think the world is dying from people to say, I want to find somebody that's willing to give. That I don't have to dance around so I can get something from them. Or they're going to get something from me. I'm afraid they're going to get their sucked the life out of me. So I got to put all these walls up. The world is starving for people that know the Lord Jesus Christ very well. So that when they're not given to by other human beings, it's okay. Because from them flows a river of living water. You see. It's the Holy Spirit that they're, they're connected to God. And they're feeding off of the Lord. You see. But Tyre, they didn't care that they were put, putting people in a very difficult situation. They didn't care that they were depersonalizing people into things. As long as they got money. As long as they gained something. Now. Um, so. It doesn't stop there. Because that had already happened. With the Philistines. Right? The Philistines had already uh, sold people to Edom. By the way. You see there. Um, the end of first six. To deliver to Edom. And then in verse 9. Entire population. To Edom. You see that? Now look at verse 11. The tra uh, for three transgressions of Edom. Huh. We'll get there a couple of weeks from now. <laughs> to Edom. Uh, it was a very, very difficult... Not only had they depersonalized people into things. Now, God says, because they delivered up the entire population to Edom. And, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. Oh my. Oh my. Initially... Tyre had had a great relationship with King David and then his son, King Solomon. Initially, it was like a great marriage. Turn with me, first of all, to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. And again, this is why it's, it's very important to look at the scriptures and to say, okay, what's going on? And to t do some research because, okay, we begin to understand what the text is saying. And so here I just want you to look at the initial relationship that Tyre had with David and Solomon and Israel. All right? Um, here, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. This is when David had uh, finally been uh, anointed king and he had taken over. And the king of Tyre, Hiram, the king of Tyre, Hiram, said, wow, David, this is awesome. So, in verse 10, or um, verse 9, so David lived in the stronghold and called the city of David. This is Jerusalem. He had conquered uh, the Jebusites. And David built an, around uh, from the Milo and inward, you know, where he fortified, he uh, made Jerusalem safe. And David became greater and greater for the Lord God of hosts was with him. Then Hiram king of Tyre, look at this sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons and they built a house for David. The king of Tyre said, man this is great. What a great thing David. You're just awesome. That was with King David. And then when King David died, his son Solomon took over, right? First King chapter 5. 
1 Kings chapter 5. That was with David, now with Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, there he is again, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Then Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that David, my father, was unable to build a house for the name of the Lord, his God, because of the wars which surrounded him, until the Lord put uh, them under his, the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest in every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to David my father saying, Your son who I will set on your throne in your place, he will build a house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut for me cedars of Le from Lebanon... And my servants will uh, be with your servants. And I will give your, you wages for your servants according to all that you say. For you know that there is no one among who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. The Sidonians were just above Tyre. And Tyre, the king of Tyre, had really control of all that area. And it came about when Hiram, the king of Tyre, heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly. And said, Blessed be the Lord today, who has given to David a wise son over this great people. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message which you have sent me. I will do what you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress uh, timber. My servants will bring down, uh, them down from Lebanon to, uh, to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place where you desire me and, and I will have them uh, broken up there and you shall carry them away then you shall accomplish my desire giving food to my household so Hiram gave Solomon as much as he desired of the cedar and cypress timber Solomon then gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of beaten oil. Thus Solomon would give uh, Hiram year by year. This is the relationship they had. And the Lord gave wisdom to Solomon just as he promised him. And there was a place between Hiram. Uh, wait a minute. Just as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. And the two of them what? Made a covenant. Hey, let's have peace between us. Let's protect each other. Your people, my people. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's, let's have this relationship. In a way, let's get married. And they made a covenant between them. That was with Solomon. And then later, later, look. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 9... A few more pages. First King chapter 9, verse 11. First King chapter 9, verse 11. Um, Hiram, king of Tyre, has supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress timber and gold according to all his desire. Then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Can you imagine? Man, you've been so good to me, man. Here's 20 cities. Wow. And then, this is the relationship they had. Look, look, verse 12. So Hiram came out from Tyre to the sea of cities, which Solomon had given to him. And they did not please him. It's like, meh. Okay. Verse 13. And he said, what are these cities which you have given to me, my brother? So they were called the land of Cabal that, uh, to this day. And Hiram, look at this. This is incredible. Look verse 14. And Hiram sent to the king 120 talents of gold. Now, most of us don't know talents. What is that? A couple of rings or what? No. 120 talents. You know how much that is? 
four and a half tons of gold. Pallets of gold. How rich do you think Tyre was? That's the relationship that Tyre had with David, with Solomon, with Israel. That was about 150 years earlier. And the relationship then started to go down and down and down. And it got to the point where Tyre was selling Jews to the enemies and breaking the promises. That's what God is talking about in Amos. Not only did you deport, depersonalize people using them as things, you didn't keep your word. And it was a repeated intensification of that sin. And remember what I said about transgression? It's a quality of sin that makes us harder of heart, more and more difficult. And by the time you know it, we're doing things that we never dreamed we would do. And we're hurting people, but we don't care anymore. For three, no, for four, I will not revoke the punishment on Tyre. There's been a full and intensification of sin. How can we get like that? How can we at one point love God and know God and then get harder and harder and harder to where you were just using people and we're empty. We're not able to give and give to others. And if we're not giving to people, we get depressed. And life is not worth living. And if we don't get depressed, we just begin to fight and fight and fight. And demand and demand and demand. Oh, if you knew my spouse and if we knew my kids and if you knew my parents and if you knew my friend, you, you, you'd see, you, I'm justified in being ugly and using foul language and clawing and scratching and manipulating. I'm justified because look at what's happened to me. Now, now, there's no excuse because Jesus came and died for all of our sins. There's no excuse. And that's what God has been telling the telling tire. No, uh uh. For three, no, for four. You've been sinning, you've been repeatedly sinning, and you have been intensifying your sin. That's what God is saying in Amos. And then he says, What's the consequences? What's the sentence? Verse 10. So I will end, send fire upon the wall of Tyre. And it will consume her citadel. Uh, Tyre. The main part of Tyre was in a, like an island off the mainland. And that island was incredibly suited for being protected. In fact... In the book of uh, Joshua, when they were going to attack, it says it's a, it's a fortified city. Fortified city. So I looked at a little bit more research, and I found out that from the mainland over to the island where Tyre, the main city was, and there was, all, of course, all kinds of other cities, and then there were fertile lands, and nothing. it was really rich. Well, when you go from the mainland to the, to the island, there was a wall 150 feet high. We think 20, 30 feet. Oh, they'll never cross. We'll try 150 feet. That's how tall the wall was that protected Tyre. What does God say? <laughs> you think that's going to stop me? Really? I'm going to send fire. It's going to be ashes. In 300 and some AD, even before that, Alexander the Great went and leveled Tyre. Leveled it. But you see, it's not that God doesn't have the power, guys. God can just go, the United States would be no more. Just a, that would be the end of it. 
But you know what he's after? He's after you and I repenting. God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance, right? That's what he's after because he's got the power to wipe out the whole universe and start all over. It's about you and I being broken and seeing that we're not trusting in the Lord. We're trusting in our own devices. We're trusting in our own flesh. You see? And God says, I'm not going to revoke that punishment. Uh, so I'm going to destroy your military. Your ships, forget it. That's what we read in uh, Isaiah 23, right? But the thing about it is that we don't know the Lord that well. And that's why we, you know, we, we miss. We miss what? We miss, listen to this. We miss really having life in us. Because we're out to protect myself all the time. And I can't say. Um, uh. And then people get close to us like, ouch, man, I got pricked by that. <laughs> Whoa, where would that come, uh, comment come from? And oh, you know, Because we don't know the Lord that well. Because when we know the Lord... In a very intimate, deep, profound way, in a dynamic way. There's this free-flowing sharing of heart with him. And we get to know his heart. What makes him angry? Like here. And we say, God, you're God. You have my life. When we have that going on, you know what can happen? We begin to act like Jesus a little bit. A little bit. Jesus was on the cross with nails on his hands and his feet. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He kept giving. Why? Because he knew his father from all eternity. That's the relationship he had with his father. And he wants us to have that relationship with, with God, the father too. And when we do, we will have life and heaven more abundantly. I don't care what the politicians do or don't do. Or what the laws are or not. Are not. We will continue to give. <clears throat> That's what God is offering. I don't know who this is. Not mine, but... <clears throat> <clears throat> get a little excited up here. <clears throat> well... <clears throat> Be quiet. You do the same. You do the same, right? <laughs> Proverbs 25. Better get going here. Proverbs 25, first application. <clears throat> Proverbs 25. Uh, first application. We need to be faithful. Let us be faithful. And sometimes faithful, being faithful means that we're going to lose out on something that we want. Right? We're going to lose out. We won't be experiencing the immediate pleasure that we want. To be faithful and not be a major hindrance and disappointment to those who depend on us. You see? Because people, they're looking for someone that they can depend on, that they can trust, that they can share their heart and know that they're not going to be blabbered all over the place. And there's a consistency there. Come hell or high water, they can trust you. And you and I are called to be faithful. Amen. Uh, I tell my wife, you know what? My body is not faithful to me. <laughs> I eat a tiny little cookie like this. <laughs> Blood sugar, like what? You're supposed to handle a little cookie. Well, it's not so little, but... <laughs> It's terrible. Yesterday was terrible. <laughs> but look, Proverbs 25, verse 19. 
Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. I remember I got invited by this couple. They had fallen in love and they were loving the church and they were like really impressed and they came and you know at one point they invited me for breakfast. Oh yeah, sure. <clears throat> and about 30 minutes before I was going to meet with them, something happened to one of my tooth. And I'm telling you, I, it hurt. Any little thing that I touched, like, uh, any little thing. And here I was supposed to eat breakfast with them. What do you want? Oh, whatever you want, Pastor. Oatmeal? <laughs> it better be soft because I, I, I mean, oh, no, you can't have that. I'm going, please. No, I, I, they ordered for me. And it was torture. Because my tooth wasn't working right. I couldn't even talk with them right. I'd say something and I'd mumble something without a pain. You ever trust somebody and then they fail you majorly? Maybe you have failed someone. And it hurts. It's like, ah. that's what this proverb is saying. That's what this proverb is saying. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot. You ever been walking around, something gets in your foot, and you can't, every time you step, it hurts? You can't even walk straight. That's what happens when you are unfaithful. Amen. When I am unfaithful. Listen. <clears throat> your family can hurt and continue to suffer because of your unfaithfulness or somebody unfaithful in your family. You're hurting. The church can hurt when you're not faithful or somebody's been unfaithful from you in the church. To you. It, it hurts. And God is saying, be faithful. What happened at the beginning? Tire. You were willing to give 4.5 tons of gold? And all of a sudden you're depersonalizing people? My people? And breaking your word? What is it going to take for you and me to stand steady and be faithful? Be faithful to the Lord. Be faithful to your word. Didn't we read that in Psalm 15? He gives his word to his own hurt. Meaning once he gives his word, even if it hurts him, he's going to keep his word. And the world is starving for somebody to be faithful. And you and I have been called to be faithful. Application number one. Application number two. There are consequences to the way we relate to fellow human beings. And God sees everything. God sees everything. How do we treat fellow human beings? He sees it all. It can be from a long time ago. Galatians chapter 6. In, in Tyre, we see, I mean, God see, has seen how Tyre had related to the people of God. Right? Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 6. Galatians 6, verse 6. And let the one <clears throat> who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Sometimes we think we can get away with it. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Wow. Wow. 
how are you treating your fellow human beings, your friends, your relatives, your spouse, your children, your parents, your fellow students, your fellow co-workers? How are you treating them? There are consequences. And they can be really, really good consequences when we're faithful, yeah. right? And those consequences, let me tell you, as I'm older now, I see, I see 20, 30, 40 years of friendship. I'm telling you, they're awesome. They're great. Oh, young people, I beg you, stay faithful and watch that you keep loving. You keep doing what is right. Amen. It'll pay off now and to eternity. So we need to be warned because if we do not, there's awful consequences. Awful consequences. All your self-protection is going to come to nothing. God's able to tear down a 150-foot wall like nothing. He can tear, tear down your walls and leave you naked. No. God will not be mocked. Be warned. Decide to treat people with dignity and respect, even if they don't, even if they don't. Application number three. I've already said it, really. What was the tire doing? Selling people, depersonalizing them. They're just things, uh, tools to be used for self or for entertainment. And is that not what's happening today? Whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, whatever. Is that not the way it's being used? Women are objectivized. They're just things, right? Things. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be in all kinds of ways that we just use people. Just use people. They're just things. Oh. Proverbs 17.5. Proverbs 17.5. says this. He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. When you mock the poor, you're reproaching God. Mm. He who rejoices at calamity will not go unpunished. Hmm. James 3 9 says, This tongue right here, we bless God and curse man who's made in the image of God. That's not what Jesus came to do, right? Jesus came and he died, rose again from the dead, so that, so that, so that the love that the Father has for the Son is the same love we would have for one another and for fellow human beings to reveal the love of the Father. And when I think of that, it's like, oh, Lord, help me. I love so poorly, God. Oh. John 17 and I'll close with this. John 17. Jesus talking to the Father. John 17. The last two verses of that chapter. Oh, righteous Father. You hear the love between Jesus and his Father? Oh, righteous Father. Although the world has not known me, not, not known thee, yet I have known thee. 
And these have known that thou didst send me. In other words, these disciples have come to know that you really love me. And that out of love you have sent me. And I have made thy name known to them. I have made your character of holiness and justice and love. Your name, your character, God. I've made it known to them. And we'll make it known. We'll continue to let him make them known to them. That the love with, wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. Reflecting God. Is what we're here on earth for. Not our own happiness. Not our own fulfillment. It just so happens. That when we love God and represent him well. Consequently we experience more love. And more life. And more satisfaction. As a consequence. Not the goal. What choices are you going to make? And if you've never known the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have the power. You might say, ah, okay, yes, I'm going to do it. But you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because when we trust in Him, that's when He gives us His Holy Spirit. So that we can live out the truth. Not go on our own steam. Right? Our own rationale, our own abilities, we're going to fizzle out. Going to fizzle out. So I pray that you've trusted. And if you haven't, it's really a choice. Amen. That you say, you know what? I've been trusting in my own goodness, in my own religiosity, in my own good works. I I'm going to stop trusting in myself and believe. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm making a decision to trust him, not myself. Trust him for salvation. And when you do, the Bible says you are headed for heaven, period. Will you? So let my life be